The FAA speaks, and we finally have an idea what's ahead for drone regulations. Okay, so here's the conference call done for the press on Sunday, February 15th. Listen in. In recent years, we have begun a series of actions designed to keep America at the forefront of aviation. We've approved several test sites around the U.S. We've developed an exemption, exemption program to enable commercial users to access this potential. And today, we take another step forward with the announcement of our small UAS rule. From entertainment to energy to agriculture, there are a host of industries interested in using UAS to improve their business. But for us at USDOT, the first threshold always is and must be keeping the American people safe as we move to integrate these new types of aircraft into our sky. Well, today we're announcing a proposed rulemaking that will help us do just that. The rule addresses two basic safety issues. One, keeping unmanned aircraft uh, uh, well clear of other aircraft. And two, mitigating any risk to people and property on the ground. As a result, we're proposing some common sense safety measures to keep everyone safe. And there are things like not allowing uh, flight of these aircraft near an airport or more than 500 feet above the ground. Or if you're operating one, they have to be within your line of sight at all times. And you have to be able to see them with your own two eyes, not with binoculars. And the aircraft must, must weigh less than 55 pounds, or you can't, and you can't operate it at night. That's and, not or. This rule does not apply to recreational users. There are already rules in place for that. Safety issues aren't just the only issues associated with unmanned vehicles. These vehicles raise privacy issues as well, which is why the president has released a memorandum on privacy that will guide how the federal government uses unmanned aircraft in our domestic airspace. We're going to be transparent about our use of this technology. We're going to use it in a way that follows the law and doesn't infringe on civil liberties. I want to thank the FAA especially for their hard work on this, and I'll turn it over now to Administrator Michael Huerta, who will give us more details on the proposed rule. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Today's proposed rule is the next step in our continuing efforts to integrate unmanned aircraft systems into our nation's airspace. As you heard from the Secretary, we've made a lot of progress. Last year, we published a comprehensive plan and roadmap to safely integrate unmanned aircraft, and we also opened six test sites across the country for research on unmanned aircraft. We approved the first ever commercial operations in the Arctic, and we have granted more than two dozen exemptions for commercial use of unmanned aircraft in domestic airspace. Today's proposed rule is a big step forward in outlining the framework that will govern the use of small unmanned aircraft weighing less than 55 pounds. This proposed rule offers a very flexible framework that provides for the safe use of small unmanned aircraft while also accommodating future innovation in the industry. As you heard from the Secretary, this technology offers many potential benefits to society. Due to the size of a small unmanned aircraft, we envision that these aircraft could be used for a wide variety of activities, particularly those that might be considered dangerous. Under this proposed rule, these aircraft could inspect utility towers, antennas, bridges, power lines and pipelines in hilly or mountainous terrain. Academic institutions could use them for educational purposes or to pursue research and development. Small unmanned aircraft could also support wildlife conservation or be used to monitor crops. They can help with search and rescue, and they, and they can be used to shoot scenes for films and television. And of course, there's a lot of interest in, aerial, in using them to take aerial photographs for real estate purposes. In many cases, unmanned aircraft can do these tasks with less risk than a manned aircraft that might have to fly in dangerous terrain or in bad weather. And in some cases, an unmanned aircraft could conduct inspections more safely than a work 
worker who would need to, for example, climb a tower. As a reminder, what we are releasing today is a proposed rule. It's not a final rule. Today's action does not authorize widespread commercial use of unmanned aircraft. That can only happen when the rule is final. In the meantime, operators must still go through the current process for a waiver or exemption to fly. Also, this proposed rule does not affect those who want to fly model aircraft as a hobby or for recreation. They already can. You simply need to fly according to our model aircraft guidelines. The FAA's unmanned aircraft website has a lot of good information on how to fly your model aircraft safely. As the Secretary said, safety is always our number one priority. This proposed rule makes sure that we are protecting other aircraft as well as people and property on the ground. I'd like to go over these safety provisions. The proposed rule accommodates aircraft up to 55 pounds, operating at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour and up to 500 feet in altitude. This keeps these small unmanned aircraft away from manned aircraft that usually fly at higher altitudes. Also, unmanned flights would be restricted near airports and in certain airspace unless air traffic control gives permission. This is to provide a buffer between manned and unmanned aircraft. This proposal would allow operations during daylight hours and would require the operator to be able to see the unmanned aircraft at all times. Rather than requiring a private pilot license, we propose that operators obtain a newly created FAA Unmanned Aircraft Operator Certificate by passing a knowledge test focusing on the rules of the air. The operator must renew their certificate every two years by passing a written proficiency test. And before each flight, operators would conduct a pre-flight inspection, just as pilots do with manned aircraft today. These small unmanned vehicles pose the least amount of risk to our airspace, and therefore, the rule would allow these aircraft to operate without the need for an airworthiness certificate. Such a certificate could take a manufacturer between three to five years to obtain. With the pace of innovation in the market, an unmanned aircraft could very well be outdated by the time it obtained a certificate. Therefore, no airworthiness certificate is needed. However, these aircraft must operate under a clear set of parameters to maintain safety, as I mentioned. The proposed rule also invites comments on a number of provisions so that we can determine the appropriate standards. Particularly, we ask the question of whether there should be a category and special rules for micro unmanned aircraft, those that weigh 4.4 pounds or 2 kilograms or less. We're asking the public to comment on whether such a category and different rules governing them should be included in the final rule. The proposed rule will be on the FAA's website and goes into greater detail in all of these provisions. The unmanned aircraft industry is expanding greatly, and this technology has the capability to dramatically change the way we use our nation's airspace. We've been working tirelessly to address all the special characteristics of unmanned flights so that we can safely expand the use of those innovative aircraft in routine operations across the country. Today's proposed rule is a milestone in that effort. We're doing everything that we can to safely integrate these aircraft while ensuring that America remains the leader in aviation safety and technology. So thank you for joining us today, and I'd like to pass it back to Secretary Fox. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, Sasha, I think you're going to help folks uh, figure out how to ask their questions. Yes, um, for any media that are on the line, I understand we have a number of stakeholders and others on the phone, but for any reporters that were able to get in, please email your questions to laura.j.brown at faa.gov or to suzanne.emmerling, E-M-M-E-R-L-I-N-G, at dot.gov, and we'll do our best to answer them. We do have a couple questions, sir. The first one comes from Joan Lowy of the Associated Press, who's on the call. Her question is this, how long before you think the rules can be made final? GAO estimated two to three years because of the requirements of the rulemaking process and expected large number of comments. 
Well, I'll start and uh, Michael jump in. We, we believe this is an important step, and we also value the input of the public in what we're putting forward today. Um, we certainly want to hear from as many stakeholders as possible, and um, that will have something to do with how long it takes us to move forward. But let me say that uh, we're committed to the overall framework of safely integrating UAS into our airspace, and this is a very important step towards that goal. And I would just add uh, that, yes, we are expecting a lot of comments, but we have provided a very comprehensive framework uh, within the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, which I think will enable us to uh, focus our analysis of each of these comments. And our objective is, as the Secretary said, to integrate unmanned aircraft safely and uh, to move this rulemaking as expeditiously as possible. All right. Um, our next question comes from Matt McFarland of the Washington Post. His question is, can you tell us more about the FAA-approved Knowledge Testing Center? What might be an example of one? Where will one take this test? And also, uh, where does one obtain an unmanned aircraft operator certificate? Michael. Okay, um, the rule lays out both of these as proposals, but our objective would be that uh, the Knowledge Testing Center would be very widely available, and there are many um, organizations that provide testing services. And so what we're looking for here is to ensure that those that want to obtain this certificate have access to it as broadly as possible. In terms of the content of that, um, the, ba the basic thing that we're trying to establish here is this is fundamentally different than being a private pilot. Uh, a, a number of requirements that might pertain to being a private pilot simply don't apply when you are uh, flying an unmanned aircraft. But what does apply is your ability to operate within airspace with other aircraft. And so the, t so the test is really focused in that area. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Jack Nickus of the Wall Street Journal. He has a couple questions, so I'll just start with the first few. To clarify, under the proposed rules, once an operator has an operator certificate from the FAA, he or she can fly any UAS under 55 pounds commercially, as long as it's during daytime under 500 feet and within sight. Is that correct? Um, the second part of that question is, once they have a blanket approval to fly commercially, is that allowable as long as they follow certain rules? Uh, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, the answer to the first question is yes, that um, as long as you're operating within the framework and you have the appropriate operator certificate, yes, that would be correct, subject to the basic rules associated with safety and airspace that are called out within the rule. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Aerospace News. Um, if a UAS operator already possesses a private pilot's license, will they still require a UAS operator's permit? Michael? Uh, yes, they would still, you can think of it as sort of an endorsement to your driver's license, uh, but it is a much streamlined process, um, and again, its principal focus is on the uh, rules of the, the rules of the air. But again, um, what we're seeking is comment on this proposed approach, and uh, we're looking forward to how the public views that. Um, the second part to that question is: Will any medical exam be required, as with a pilot's license? Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, there, there would not be a, a separate requirement for a medical exam. All right. Um, the next question comes from Aaron Cooper of CNN. Even when all commercial use uh, has been banned, we still see a number of close calls between UAS and manned aircraft. Will we see more close calls now that more UAS will be allowed to fly? And how will we ensure that the UAS, that, how will the FAA ensure that the UAS comply with rules? and ensure that they avoid airports and manned aircraft? Well, part of putting this rule out is taking another step towards um, establishing a framework for the safest possible integration of UAS into the airspace. Um, and uh, I think as we go through the comment period and work with 
those who give us their feedback will um, hopefully uh, either learn that we've uh, done this exactly right or we'll find some ways that we can tweak it to make it um, uh, the strongest possible rule in terms of, um, of, of avoiding uh, those issues and also ensuring that we have the kind of uh, enforcement mechanisms that enable us um, to protect uh, other users in the airspace. Michael. Yeah, there are two dimensions, and the Secretary touched on them. Uh, the first is education, making sure that everyone understands what the rules are, and uh, the rule sets out um, that framework. But we've also uh, done a fair amount of that, and we will continue to do that. As an indication of that is our No Before You Fly campaign that we've done in conjunction with industry that we started at the end of last year. Uh, we also, of course, have enforcement tools uh, that are available, and uh, what we want to uh, do is ensure that anyone who is flying in a careless or reckless manner that would be endangering uh, the public or other users of the airspace, that uh, we take in appropriate enforcement action against those activities. Okay, our next uh, question comes from Dan Roberts of The Guardian. Can you talk more about the requirement for line of sight visibility? Does this rule out the use of drones for deliveries as Amazon has been suggesting? And what do you make of their threat to take their technology abroad if they cannot get the regulatory reform they've been demanding? Michael, I'll clean up. Okay. Um, I think first and foremost, um, I want to stress that what this represents is another step in a process that has a lot of components. And what we are very focused on is right now is this very large class of potential users. And the rule does contemplate that it would be line of sight activities, but we do permit the use of visual observers. Now, separately, we have ongoing uh, two activities that are continuing to push the frontier beyond that. One is um, a pretty aggressive research program on beyond visual line of sight. And then the second is the um, exemption process, which the secretary referenced, where we can consider and have the ability to consider specific uses that people might want to put forward as the regulatory framework begins, continues to evolve. So this is not the final word on the full scope of UAS operations. This is an extremely important step, but there will be continue to be other activities that will address this industry as it continues to evolve. Mr. Secretary? Yeah, I, I just I, I just want to underscore that um, we know that technology is changing very rapidly, and that is why we have a very comprehensive framework that we're working through, of which today's announcement is one feature. Uh, we're not done yet, and we're going to continue working to ensure that we're moving as quickly as possible, but also as safely as possible to ensure that we uh, integrate these, uh, these new uh, uh, technologies into the airspace. All right. Um, the next question um, comes actually from a variety of reporters who, who've all asked similar questions about the line of sight requirement. This one in particular is from the Wall Street Journal. Any flexibility on the line of sight requirement in the sense of what happens when see and avoid technology continues to be further developed? Do you foresee that line of sight requirement being changed by the time this rule is made final if see and avoid technology is proven by then? Well, one of the good things about a, a comment period is that it gives us a chance to to get feedback, and uh, also as the studies that Michael just referenced continue, uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, I think we're putting forward what we believe to be um, the safest possible approach at the moment, um, but of course we look forward to hearing back from the public. And I, and I would just add that um, we also look at, need to look at this in the context of what does this suggest with respect to the certification of the aircraft. But as the Secretary said, uh, what we're looking for is for people to comment on this as we framed us and to, as we framed uh, these requirements going forward. And if there is data or analysis they would like to present as part of the comment period, we encourage them to do that. 
All right. Um, the next question comes from Congressional, uh, from CQ Roll Call. Um, what penalties will be applied to unlicensed operators? Uh, how, does the FAA, how does the FAA ensure that operators are not flying beyond line of sight, for example, to survey very large remote farms and ranches? And how would the FAA even know if someone in the middle of Nebraska is not obeying line of sight rules? As I talked about before, we're focused in two areas. One is to educate people on what the rules are, and then the second is to ensure that they're not operating in a careless or reckless manner and ensuring that uh, we're taking appropriate uh, enforcement action as, as needed. What we're laying out here is a flexible regulatory framework that um, can provide a clear roadmap for everyone of how this very large class of unmanned aircraft can operate in the national airspace system. And uh, the rule, if finalized, is or as it becomes finalized, is going to provide probably the most flexible regime for unmanned aircraft, 55 pounds or less, that exist anywhere in the world. And so what we want to accommodate are the sorts of things that uh, folks are looking for ultimately. But we need to do this in a staged way that ensures the highest levels of safety because that's what people expect of the airspace and the aviation system. Um, and with that, I think that will be our last question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, do you have any wrap-up comments? Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. It's, it's, a, it's an exciting day for aviation and for the future of uh, unmanned aircraft in the U.S. Uh, as I said before, our work is not done. We know that. We're going to keep pushing forward. And uh, I want to say again how much I appreciate the great work of our FAA team on getting us to the day. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we'll look forward to receiving comments on the proposed rule. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody.